Influence Continuum. This is a podcast all about influence, not just destructive influence like the ones we see in cults, but also the ethical, healthy side of influence. Stephen Hassan with another episode of the Influence Continuum. And today I have a special guest with me, Yasmin Mohammed, uh, whose book Unveiled I just finished last week, in fact, and it was so moving. And I reached out to you, Yasmin, and, and said, wow. And you said, would you come on my thing? And I did that. Uh, so we did a video where where you were kind of interviewing me, and now I get to interview you. But let me give uh, my listeners a little bit more on your background. Let's start with your book, Unveiled. It's a powerful memoir and polemic, but I don't think it's that polemical. It recalls your experiences being raised in a fundamentalist Islamic household, and you were arranged to a marriage, a man that you didn't choose, uh, who turned out to be an Al-Qaeda operative, uh, and just the incredible amount of religious trauma and abuse that women uh, suffer from. And I was mentioning to you previously that I've worked with extremist Jewish cults, Christian cults, and now I'm getting more of an education on what uh, Islam is doing in its more extreme uh, forms. And, and of course, what's different is that there are state-run Sharia law countries. That's different. I mean, the Christian right wants to make the U.S. that mm -hmm. way and impose mm -hmm. their version of reality, which is anti-women's rights, anti-gay rights, anti-indigenous rights, anti-right, you know, anti-Semitic right, et cetera, et cetera. So you've gone on to start a, a nonprofit. Is it a nonprofit? Freeheartsfreeminds.org. Yes. Free and it offers mental health support for members of the LGBTQ community, free thinkers living within Muslim majority countries. And a lot of my listeners don't realize people can be threatened to be killed if they mm -hmm. speak out against Mohammed or. Right now, there's an Iranian revolution where women are being courageous and protesting publicly, and I want to get into that. Uh, and um, you're just so impressive, and you really are a, a great example of a survivor thriver, someone who's really taken trauma and gone beyond and to the point where you've not only healed working on healing yourself more and more, but helping others to heal. And for me, it was very therapeutic to help others mm -hmm. back 45 years ago. And it's just been a continuous learning experience for me. So Yasmin Mohammed, welcome to the Influence Continuum. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Stephen Hassan. You know, what you were saying about me taking, sort of surviving and then thriving, that's exactly what you've done as well. And so I, I, you know, I, I recognize that in you and I appreciate that in you because I know how much harder it is to stay involved in work that is not, it's, you know, it's not just a, um, it's not just an intellectual exercise. It's not just a theoretical thing. You know, you, when you're speaking to people, when you're counseling people, you're empathizing with them. You're feeling, you know, you felt what they are feeling. Mm -hmm. And um, it's so much more difficult to do the work when you have that kind of emotional connection. But it's so much more important for people like us to do the work because, you know, we're the ones that they can empathize with the most. And um, yeah, right. it's important for us to share. So I just want to compliment you uh, and say that for me, my trauma was far less extreme. Uh, and I was 
it's a weird way of saying it that I was fortunate to be recruited at age 19 into the moon cult, whereas you were born into this environment with a narcissistic mother and uh, a father who was not present, an abusive stepfather who used to beat you and torture you in corporal punishment. So what for for me, you are what's called a second generation survivor, someone who was born in so that it was your family of origin influencing you as well as the larger uh, group influence. So uh, I think you your your journey is far more impressive to me. I just got bitten by the bug of realizing I love to counsel, I love to help people to to learn and grow and heal, and I love to learn. And so each, even this, you know, meeting you and reading your book, I just like to expand my perspectives. And as mm -hmm. you know from from talking with me previously, I'm I'm grounded in human rights. Like that's my yeah. doctrine <laughs> is the UN Universal Definitely. Declaration of Human Rights which is bigger than any one country or bigger than any one religion. And it's an evolving uh, need to keep reminding people uh, how many people are not free to be their true self. Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I think it's interesting that there's a lot of Muslim majority countries who refused to sign. They created their own called the Cairo Declaration. And of course it removed a lot of the women's equality or LGBT equality, you know, or any of the, they, they, they wanted to keep their anti-Semitism, you know, the, so there was a lot of, um, you know, it's interesting to note that it's not as universal as we, as we'd hope. So you just taught me another thing because I did not know <laughs> that fact that there's a, they did a variation. I know the Chinese government didn't sign the UN Declaration of Human Rights either. Um, mm -hmm. But please, for my listeners, uh, share your background story, uh, and then we can go from there. Okay. So my mom was born and raised in a pretty secular Egypt where she wore mini skirts. She had friends that were Christian. Um, she was, she never prayed, you know, she was, a she had a boyfriend in university who turned out to, you know, who she ended up marrying and that's my dad. Um, but when her and my dad got married, they moved to San Francisco. So this is San Francisco in the, in the late sixties, early seventies. So it was the peace, love and, and hippie era. And even though she grew up in a secular Egypt, it's still, it, it's still a conservative society in comparison to San Francisco at the time. I think probably the whole world was conservative compared to San Francisco at the time. Mm. Um, so it was a bit much for her. And um, so her and my dad moved to Vancouver, Canada, and that's where I was born. So I was the third child. My brother and I were both born in Canada. Once they uh, got to Canada, though, their marriage fell apart. So my mm. mom was still pregnant with me when my dad left. He was like this, you know, that they couldn't make the marriage work. Moving geographical locations doesn't help a marriage. You know, you're still the same people. Um, and so she found herself with three kids in a relatively new country, new community, new society. And she was all alone, single mom to three kids. So where does she go looking for support and community? The mosque. Not because she was necessarily Muslim, like to like she wasn't religious, but it was just somewhere where she thought she'd go and find, you know, other Arabic speakers or, um, you know, other people that she could connect with on a, on a cultural level. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, as fate would have it, the imam of the mosque at the time, the man who was the caretaker of the mosque living in the mosque was the man, uh, who she would end up marrying. So he was already married. He already had three children, but he took my mom on as his second wife um, and a second set of, of three children. Mm. He was a, what we now recognize, a, an Islamist. So mm. at the time, this sort of difference between a Muslim who is just a person who practices their faith in their home or in their mosque and isn't really 
concerned about politicizing the religion or expanding the religion, um, proselytizing or even um, uh, converting people through a, a what's called dawa. So mm. it's sort of like missionary work. Yeah. Um, so this was a, a, a relatively new thing because of Iran and the, the Islamic regime there. Saudi Arabia and Egypt and all these other Sunni countries started to feel like they also wanted to have Islam in their political powers to kind of counter the Shia Islamic country. Because although there are um, slight variations, um, Shia Muslims and Sunni Muslims are at odds with each other. Yeah, that, that um, I, I should really say want to highlight Sunnis for people who are not educated that there is this division even though they both follow muhammad and the quran they are kind of enemies of each other yes. on some level or rivals for exactly yeah so yeah. please continue yeah and um so the what happened in iran sort of started this ripple effect throughout the rest of the muslim majority world and people started to become more politically aware, wanting mm -hmm. to sort of um, Islamize countries and, and spread Islam and in a way that they were never really interested in before. So I just want to reiterate that when my mom was growing up, you wouldn't really see hijab in Cairo where she grew up. You would see hijab in the in the in the villages, you know, mm -hmm. you wouldn't find people uh, reciting put on or anything unless you're out in the villages it was like the mm -hmm. illiterate people do you know what I mean like it was it was mm -hmm. kind of relegated the mm -hmm. the anybody who was educated or in the city was like past religion at that point mm -hmm. um well I mean there is still Muslims but you know what I mean they weren't fundamentalists sure. well I think about the continuum right from the healthier respect for human rights to the authoritarian dissociative disorder level which is what yeah. we're talking about now, I think. That's what he was. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what he was. And he pulled her right in. He started telling her that the reason why she her marriage fell apart was because she wasn't good enough of a Muslim. And the reason why, because for, for an Egyptian woman at that time to find herself a single mom of three kids was like this huge dishonor on the family. Mm. She felt like she failed as a human being. Mm. She felt like she didn't belong anywhere. You know, like there was a lot of uh, just social pressure that comes with that. Mm -hmm. she, she felt degraded, mm -hmm. uh, like she had no value. So anyway, he really just encouraged her to get involved in all of this stuff. She started, mm. you know, she started she just accepted it hook, line, and sinker. I think that at that point in her life, she was going through a depression. Mm -hmm. When I think back now with my adult mind and I, I see the kinds of things she was doing, I recognize like, oh, this woman was depressed. Um, and he came in and sort of like swooped her. And, you know, there was this community that was available for her. All she had to do was follow the, the, the cult membership rules, you know, and so she was more than willing to do that. Um, Which I think of her like clothing, as a born again right? Muslim, absolutely, the and the, all the mm -hmm. rituals and the beliefs most, most centrally, uh, yeah. this black and white, all or nothing, good versus evil. We are the truth. Everyone else is, you know, satanic and evil spirited, and and it's okay to it. trick the outsiders. The or ultra orthodox Jews have the same kind of thing it's okay to lie to them because they're not part of the true thing but of course you know i'm jewish but i'm not by any stretch orthodox or ultra orthodox but from that perspective i am haram i am yes i am yes. not kosher at all yeah my form yeah. of judaism i respect gay rights i have a gay son yeah. for example and belong to a very progressive uh, sem uh, te uh, temple with a female rabbi, head rabbi. Um, so really uh, pushing the buttons of the ultra orthodox. Anyway, I'm back to yeah. Islam, please, in your story. Yeah. So no, you got it. I mean, Islam is just the third in this trilogy, you know, with <laughs> Judaism being the first. So they're the, the three of these monotheistic Abrahamic religions 
are, are very similar in so many ways. Um, so yes, exactly that. He came along into our lives. My mom had to start wearing hijab. We started, my sister and I started wearing hijab soon after. Um, we could no longer have non-Muslim friends. We could no longer have birthday parties. We could no longer ride our bikes. Well, my sister and I, my brother still could. We could no longer go swimming. Again, that's for my sister and I, not for my brother. And um, at one point he, because music is considered forbidden, he sat us down. This was a real moment for me in my childhood when he grabbed my mom's records. She had this record player that I was always fascinated with. Like how is sound coming out of like plastic grooves? I used to stare at the needle and lift it up and drop it down. And I just, I thought it, it I was so mesmerized by this machine and I loved it. Mm -hmm. And it had Dolly Parton and Kenny Rogers and all this really fun country music that my mom loved. And he started breaking all of her records. And she just stood there next to him, looking down at the carpet. And then he passes the records to us and he says, break these. I'm not gonna break my mom's things. Like what is wrong with this man, you know? Right. And she was not resisting. She just let him break her things. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the moment of realization that this man is in charge now, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. He's here to take over. And my mom was 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 really diminished at that point. Um, and she didn't fight for herself. She just let it happen. Mm -hmm. And from then on, um, you know, it well, was, was a you lot have of to corporal memorize. punishment from my absolutely. And, and, yeah. and, you know, I've done blogs on just how bad it is for children to be beaten, uh, especially when for religious reasons or, you know, I love you, whack, whack, you know, or yeah, yeah. in your case, there was one episode where I believe where you were hung upside down and beaten at the bottom of your feet. That's straight out torture. Yeah, Horrible. that happened to me once that used to happen to my brother quite often. Um, yeah, and that that was the case that I told my teacher about and um, ended up, he called the cops and child services were involved and there was this huge, you know, family this court This was in case. Canada, I believe. This was in Canada, yeah. And the judge and in the said? End, oh, that's your culture, that's your family, that's their way of, that's the way they choose to discipline you. That's, you know, he played, he did the whole moral relativism, cultural relativism thing of like, oh, you know, that's, that's, that's their culture. We can't judge. Well, you're a judge, so yeah, right. <laughs> that's your job. And it happens the same yeah. in the in the U.S. with uh, Christian corporal punishment. You know, and they and they misquote the Torah, the Jewish scripture about spoil. You know, spare the rod, spoil the child is the verse from Deuteronomy, I believe that they they quote. I anyway. It's so frustrating because we live in 2022 now, almost 2023, mm -hmm. and these things are from another era completely yeah. where they didn't even understand germ theory or electricity, much less mm -hmm. um, what we now know about neuroscience and developmental psychology and you know yeah. what's, what's healthy <laughs> for young yeah. people to be exposed to and what's bad. So all... Yeah, and those same edicts are in Islam as well about um, hitting the child if they refuse to pray or if they miss prayers or if they don't memorize the Quran. So, yeah, it, they they take these ancient words and do not, you know, like they they read them today as if fourteen hundred years haven't passed. Right, and in the Jewish religion, at least when the temple was destroyed the tradition morphed to rabbinic interpretation. So Jews don't believe that scripture is the inerrant word of God and has to be followed literally at all. In fact, in the, in the, in the rabbinic world over the hundreds of years, there were fights, theological fights of how to interpret things and both points of view or three points of view were incorporated. So there was no one truth or one mm. proper way 
So, and, and for me, what I, what I resonate with is, is this lack of truth with a capital T and questioning is one of the most valuable, important things, at least in my, my life. Yeah, it was the exact opposite in, as I was growing up. Um, so this is, as you know, because we spoke about this before when I was reading your book, how much it resonated with me because we were, we did what you refer to as uh, thought stopping. Is that correct? Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. We weren't allowed to think. Thinking was discouraged. In fact, it was punished. If we, mm -hmm. if we started to ask too many questions, then it was the devil whispering in our ear and we are the bad person for having these questions. And so you just, you have to like sit in this nonsensical, you know, every time you try to go in a direction, you just bang your head into a wall. So you stop, you stop thinking. And as you said in your book, you just go numb because there, there's no point. It, it, none of it makes sense and you can't question it. And so it was, um, yeah, the exact opposite of, of celebrating yeah, any kind of critical thinking. Yeah, it's to blind of obedience to authority, uh, even though the authority is not educated as much as we were and et cetera. And one theme with all mind control relationships and cults is the, the leader, the doctrine, the policy is perfect. It's your problem yes. if you have any difficulty with so, it that's the literal quote that we hear all the time mm. islam is perfect muslims are not mm. i mean i don't know if you got if people out in the world hear that as much as we did growing up but that mm. was just drilled into our heads whenever you'd see anything you'd say well what about this terrorist attack you know what about al-qaeda you know flying planes into the building well islam is perfect muslims are not and that was always just the way of of ignoring all of these things that are done in the name of Islam constantly. But if I'm remembering correctly, most of the terrorists who flew the planes into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon were from Saudi Arabia and they were middle class. And my understanding when I was starting to research uh, Islamist cults was uh, that there were madrasas that have been set up and funded to indoctrinate young children to become suicide bombers for the faith. That's absolutely correct. Yes, that's very true. Now, what I meant by that was that's the outside voice that you referred to earlier on in this conversation. So you've got the inside voice and the outside voice. Mm -hmm. So the inside voice, yes, it's true. Madrasas did set this up. I learned that in Islamic school. I wasn't surprised when I saw this happening. Mm -hmm. Nobody who was born and raised in a, in a Muslim family or community would have been surprised at this because we know that that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to kill the infidels and you're supposed to um, try and make make them feel fear and terror mm -hmm. so that everybody follows Islam, so that mm -hmm. this whole world is uh, pure and clean and following Allah the way yeah, it should Yeah, they want be. to take over the world, just like my former yes. cult, the Moonies, wanted to take over the world and we'll kill everybody who doesn't obey our rules because we exactly. are perfect, we have the Messiah, and mm -hmm. uh, we can save people later in the spirit world. We'll just take them away from their physical bodies was what I was trained to believe and would have done. I would have done violence too. It's terrible. It's terrible to remember that and to think that. I'm, I remember reading in your book when you talked about that moment where you where you thought of hurting your father. Um, yeah, I was yeah, thinking of snapping his neck while he was driving on the Long Island Expressway. Uh, I was in the back seat with a big cast on my leg moving locations during my deprogramming but I was so indoctrinated that my family was satanic and any any force or any person that was trying to take me away from the group was taking trying to take me away from God and therefore I had I had an obligation to do everything in my power to stop it fortunately I was so indoctrinated I was like they can never break me my yeah. faith is too strong I don't need to do this it wasn't that I was 
oh my goodness, I'm thinking of snapping my father's neck and creating a car accident on an expressway and how many other innocent people would be killed. None of that. It was just like, no, I know the truth. I know the Messiah. God is with me. I can withstand any test of my faith. That was how crazy and fanatical yeah. I was. Especially knowing you as I know you as such an empathetic, kind, giving soul. And for you to be turned into this literal monster, you know, it, it's, it, it just speaks to the, the power of this mind control. Um, and it's, it's, it is really terrifying. Yep. And, and that's that's part of my story of why I got, became a mental health professional and why I've been so outspoken and taking on well, I, the last couple of years. I've spent a lot of time learning about the indigenous uh, world and just how horrible uh, colonization has been, specifically with the First Nations uh, uh, people in Canada. Uh, but realizing this is a worldwide phenomenon, realizing the Pope in the 15th century did the doctrine of discovery that said basically go out in the world, find new lands. If people don't convert, kill them, mm. convert them or kill them. And I was like, a familiar theme. Wait a minute. I was I was deprogrammed learning about Chinese communist brainwashing, and I thought they had the. <laughs> you know, the paradigm of brainwashing, but this was hundreds of years earlier where, where they had missionaries starting residential schools, stealing indigenous children from their families, cutting off their hair, taking off their clothing, yeah. and just trying to make them good little white Christian people. Horrible. So anyway, for me, learn, taking on Islam now, okay, you know, um, I've already talked out against, you know, Islamist terrorist groups like ISIS, etc. But uh, of course, the United States especially, but around the world, we have these uh, white Christian, you know, uh, new apostolic reformation cult groups that need to take over the world for Jesus. Only it's not Jesus's teachings about love and kindness and service and protecting the mm -hmm. world and protecting immigrants. It's their version, which is uh, totally co-opted of, of the, the love message that I think should be at the heart of any religious tradition. Yeah, I think it's important to, to make those parallels that you're just making right now, because people tend to look at Islam as sort of something different or something special or something exotic and Eastern. Um, but it's important to recognize that the fact that they've been able to enjoy that um, that place on the shelf as the sacred cow that can't be criticized is the reason why they have become so powerful. So, you know, politically powerful. And that's why, you know, because we're not recognizing the danger. You know, if, if anybody wants to say anything about the danger, it's considered, you know, bigoted or Islamophobic or, or whatever. And so we, we silence it. Though we're very comfortable criticizing the dangers when we see it coming from evangelical Christians or Christian nationalists. Mm -hmm. So they are going to have a harder time getting their work done because there's a lot of vocal people standing in their way. Whereas the fundamentalist Muslims, the extremist Muslims, the Islamists, they've all got carte blanche. Now they've got carte blanche over there, obviously, because people are afraid for their lives. We can see what's happening in Iran to get an idea of that. You know, you can't even wear what you want to wear without fear of, of yeah, being killed talk by about the Iran religious for police. A, for a minute, because yesterday I was watching uh, uh, Fareed Zakaria's story, and they, they did a story interviewing an Amnesty uh, International expert, um, uh, Nazanin Boniari, am I pronouncing her name correctly, yeah. was very articulate about the need to support the protest movements and women's rights and gay rights. Um, can, please uh, share. Yeah, no, she's absolutely correct. We have to support them. They are not only 
trying to save their country from the Islamic Republic. It's truly saving the rest of us. So even for people who are feeling like it's none of our business, that's over there. No, you have to understand the kind of geopolitical power that Iran has, the oil reserves that Iran has, like fourth in the world, and the very tight relationship that Iran has with countries like Russia and China. So it is very important, obviously, for all of the human rights reasons that you mentioned, 100%. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why I've been supporting Iranians since the minute I became public. Mm -hmm. um, but also, it's not just for those reasons. You know, hijab started all this when they were burning the hijab in the streets. Um, but it's not only about the control that they have over women and, um, you know, all of the the fact that they kill gay people, the fact that they will execute somebody for drinking alcohol, you know, any any breaking mm -hmm. of their religious rules. Um, mm -hmm. But it's also the fact that they have this desire to spread their ideology throughout the planet, as they, as they call it, we want to globalize the revolution, being the Islamic revolution, right. um, the Islamic regime. They want to globalize that. And of course they want to globalize that. That's what they all do. That's what all the Islamists do. They have tasted this power and they want more and more of it. Um, and when they're partnering with, with such countries as Russia and China, the rest of the world needs to pay attention, especially us here in North America. We need to be paying attention. We do not want that uh, alliance to happen. I mean, this, this, that, that's, yeah, it's I mean, I don't even happened, want to guess of what could happen. Mm -hmm. How to empower people to have a choice and to not have religious ideology used as a, as a bludgeon and literally as a cage, psychological prison uh, to uh, manipulate and control people. And I guess I can't help myself but say, you know, oil, uh, it's not gonna help the planet survive by keep keeping these oil-rich uh, countries um, manipulating the information uh, space and diverting our attention from what needs to happen, which is we need to bring down, um, you know, greenhouse gases as soon as possible. So that's another yeah. geopolitical, you know, addition uh, for, for concern. Um, but can, can we uh, also just touch on Afghanistan? Because obviously yeah. America interfered. In, yes, I, I, I understand about going after Al-Qaeda, but then they were trying to uh, help uh, modernize Afghanistan. And then the Taliban, you know, basically said, no, we're going back to the old ways. What's happening um, in Afghanistan that you know of? It's the mind control that you're talking about. That's what's happening in Afghanistan. They have very low levels of, of literacy in Afghanistan. There's very high levels of crime in Afghanistan. The Taliban come in, they let, they let them think, oh, we are the ones, we're gonna be your saviors. We're the ones who are gonna protect you. It's essentially a mafia. Mm. We're, we're gonna protect you, protect us from who? <laughs> protect you from us, that's who we're mm. gonna protect you from, mm. you know? Um, so it's, uh, it's a, it's, it's a very fear. difficult situation. It's about fear. Absolutely. It's about fear. And they have such a grip on the country and you can see some protests happening in, in Afghanistan, but of course they're nowhere near the size of the protests that are happening in, in Iran mm -hmm. because the Iranian people for the past 40 years have been fighting against this Islamic regime. Mm -hmm. They they never wanted this Islamic regime. They were never really brainwashed in the same way that the uh, that the Afghans were because mm -hmm. the Afghans sort of came from they went from being in the villages and being very simple people to the Taliban. There wasn't mm -hmm. really that much of a gap in between mm -hmm. whereas the Iranians had a gap in between. So they 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 don't want to give up on um, the the progress that they've made in their country, not just the progress with women, but the progress in technology and in art and education and so many other aspects. Um, exactly. So education is you know yeah. understanding 
and thinking. Yeah. And that's why girls in Afghanistan haven't been allowed to go to school in, you know, in over a year now, mm -hmm. because they know that the best way to control people is to keep them uneducated, is to keep them illiterate, actually. And if you can control the girls, then you're, con you're controlling the mothers. Mm -hmm. So you're controlling the children. And there you go. You've got control over the whole society yeah. um and and there you go it's it's a it's a horrible situation yeah so please share about um your organization and what you're trying to do and how we can help so my organization is called free hearts free minds and it really was born out of the fact that uh, so when i wrote my book unveiled i got so many letters from so many people around the world telling me how they relate to my story, sharing their stories with me, and telling me how much they appreciate that I'm living in a Western world and I have the freedom to speak for them because they obviously cannot speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. And so from that, I recognized, I mean, I knew this already to, at a, on a certain level, but I recognized how drastic you know how lucky i was essentially mm. here i am you know people read my story and they think my gosh you know i'm i'm shocked that you've survived and it's true you know if not yeah. for the flap of a butterfly's wing i mean i i don't know how i'm sitting here talking to you today like there, it, it, it could have gone you wrong have a in powerful so many different spirit ways. yasmin that's my <laughs> professional assessment You're, oh thank you, have you. A, you you never you never lost your authentic self uh, you know for, as as he, and you said you were like a black sheep and you always question yeah. when no one else did but i've met other people born into extremist cults who are like that they just have a very strong clear spirit and in touch with you know their intuition their heart their soul but please continue yeah so i i'm really grateful that um, I was living in Canada in a secular society so that when I finally had the courage to let my authentic self out, I was able to continue on with my life. I was able, I got away from my family. I could get student loans. I could go to university. You know, I, I could make a life for my daughter and I away from all of the, these, you know, the, the trauma of my childhood. And mm -hmm. I didn't want my daughter to have anything to do with that. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're a woman in Saudi Arabia or in Pakistan or in Sudan or in Somalia or a man or a gay man, my goodness, like, you know, you, you can't do that. Right. You're living. It's not just about your family, which obviously is the first concentric circle you have to deal with. Right. But then you've got the community around you and then you've got law enforcement and you've got the government. And if you're in so many Muslim majority countries, women are restricted from even leaving, like traveling unless they have a male guardian with them. So they're in prison. They're all in open air prisons. Hmm. So even though they might also have that internal fire within them and they you know they feel all of the same things that i was feeling they physically couldn't get themselves out of the situation mm -hmm. and so that's what made me start free hearts free minds because i was empathizing with as if it was this difficult for me imagine the people that are in living in muslim majority countries now so it's free hearts free minds free hearts referring to the lgbt community and free minds referring to free thinkers mm -hmm. uh, both groups of people could be executed for their crimes um, and so what we do is we we offer like psychosocial support we offer group group support but group support is very important because you lose you know you can't uh, you lose your friends, you lose your family, you lose any connection you had with people because you're different. You know, you're the you're the black sheep. Um, and so if you're willing to um, or you're shunned if you are out, if you, but you're correct. you're not wanting you're lucky to be if you're out. Shunned. Right. Because yes, you could, that's right. You could get arrested or or attacked or, you know, thrown yeah. in jail. But I yeah. guess through the Internet, you can realize I'm not alone. Other people are yes. suffering too and have mm -hmm. exemplars like yourself to say, yes, there is life. Like right now you may be stuck, but opportunities can develop or you can make them for yourself. Yeah. And if I'm remembering correctly, you took a job in Qatar, was it? To get out of, away from your family, but to get money. 
and yeah. can, you know pay off your student loans, etc. But then you were still living a double life, if I remember your yep. story correctly. Yeah, I, it was less, much less of a double life in Qatar because I was working for a Canadian college. So um, we all lived on the same compound. And so I my see. my coworkers and everybody that I played with, worked with, lived with were all Canadians. And so um, it was less of a double life that I had to live when I was in Canada when I had to wear hijab during the day. Mm. Um, but it was... There was a, a bit of a double life in that I never wanted a soul to even get a hint that I used to be Muslim. Uh -huh. Because if that gets out, you know, it could be detrimental for me and my daughter. So I was yeah, very careful to just be, I'm questions. Canadian. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was very, mm. very scary. Mm -hmm. So I didn't interact with any Arabs when I was there because I didn't want there to be any kind of accidental familiarity mm -hmm. or anything like that. So they just assumed because Egypt is 10% um, Christian. Mm -hmm. And so they just made the assumption with my name being the name of a flower, it doesn't have any religious connotation. They just made the assumption that I grew up Christian in Egypt or that I was Christian in Canada. And I just let it, I never corrected them on that obviously so your first name you mean was a flower not yes your last yes name. <laughs> no well my last name is actually my husband's last name i very happily took his last name I because see. <laughs> i was happy to get rid of my last name um but i keep muhammad as a pen name mm -hmm. i understand yeah. Yeah. So, um, in other words, let me just ask you. So, if if uh, if there's a man who isn't gay, but he's in a Muslim majority country and is doubting and question, is that person welcome to attend your oh session? Absolutely. Yes. 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 It's it's men and women and gay and straight and everything in between. Everybody okay. is welcome. The only. Uh, criteria we have of course a, a vetting process you have um, to. where we we have to you make sure we check the person's identity and have a you know an interview with them to to sure make sure that they're not somebody who's trying to infiltrate or exactly. you know you have to be very careful about keeping everybody's safety it's a it's a they're putting their lives in your hands when they come to you and trust you yep. uh, with this program so um yes the only thing that is required is that they are are already ex-muslims that, that they've already denounced islam mm -hmm. so we're not um helping people to pull them out of the religion mm -hmm. um they have to have already pulled themselves out and are ready now to to move forward with the with the with the steps of mm -hmm. of that comes after that mm -hmm. um, so our very first session is identity and you can just imagine when you're born and raised in a cult, you don't have, you don't know who you are. You're just, as you mentioned, you're just the clone um, in the image of the cult in order to survive. Right. A and persona. so um, mm -hmm. the persona, yeah, the John John. I'm learning all of these things from your book now, which is so validating and, and so supportive. And um, my counselors are all very excited about taking the the courses that you've got offered on uh, freedom of mind. Oh yeah, I just posted uh, my online uh, contribution to, because so many people are like co-opted by conspiracy ideology or, or coming out of cults, but don't understand that they were in a mind control cult. And so this is aimed at clinicians and coaches and mental health professionals. But so far, the people who I've been hearing the most from are actually former members or people trying to rescue someone from a, a mind control group. And they're telling me how, how valuable it has been for their healing or for their understanding. So I'm, I'm really happy about that because I'm only one person. But this way, mm -hmm. I get to scale it. I get to put my my teaching online and people can take it whenever they want to. And uh, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed that it will get translated into other languages so we can have a bigger reach 
um, with yeah. the material. And with that, I do want to tell you, I, I told the story of a friend, Masood Bani Sadr, who was an MEK, which was an Iranian terrorist cult for 20 years. I tell that story in combating. And a number of years ago, he mailed me this from Iran, a pirated copy of my second book, Releasing the Bonds. Um, and um, so at least it's out there um, yeah. in other la some other languages and such. So um, I loved your book. It was so personal and, and you were so honest uh, about the, the, what you're experiencing. And I did want to comment that when, because I've seen this pattern over a number of decades, when people are born in an extreme cultic mind control thing and they have a child, it changes mm -hmm. their perspective because they, they, in a sense, they, they, because of the role of being a mother, and I, I can say as a father as well, um, you start thinking, you start putting yourself in your kid's shoes and you start remembering what you didn't like about your childhood. And even though yeah. we, we tend to want to parent the way we were parented when we had such an obviously horrific experience, we want to go in the other extreme. We don't want to, our, we want to protect our kids and give them a healthier environment. And that's motivated a lot of people to exit these mind control cults. Yeah, I, I tell my daughter all the time that she saved my life because as much as I hated it and I was unhappy and I was, I was too scared to do anything and I just was, I was controlled by fear. Mm -hmm. But when I had her and you know how it is when you're newborn, like you would just, your first child as a newborn, you're just filled with every possible desire to protect this baby, to never let them know unhappiness. You know, you just would do anything to right. keep them safe and happy. Um, and, so there was a moment where my mom and uh, the man she forced me to marry started to talk about taking my daughter to get uh, female genital mutilation um, performed on her. And they were talking about, uh, you know, what age would be appropriate to take her to Egypt to get this done. And um, that was the moment when I was when it like I just it's like I came out of this trans and I knew at, right then and there like even with a high school education does all of the things that I was telling myself you can't leave because x y z right. none of that mattered anymore I was going to get my daughter and I was going to get her out of this situation before they had an opportunity to hurt her um so you know, I, I, I couldn't explain, imagine it. if I can for my listeners who may not be familiar with female genital mutilation mutilation uh are you comfortable talking about it or would you like me to instead because i can tell by your face that it's still very very it's, you know upsetting. it's a it's a tough subject um you know it's obviously made more tough because i'm talking about my daughter but yeah unfortunately in egypt it's 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 up to close to 90 percent of women have had it done to them it's very sort of medicalized in Egypt. It's supposedly criminalized very recently, but that doesn't stop anybody because they feel like they are doing this. Um, they're happy to break the laws of secular people if it means that they're following the laws of a law, right? So it, it doesn't matter. So was to it? Them that uh, it's I know in Judaism, males are supposed to be circumcised on the eighth Same. day. But uh, in Judaism, there's no discussion about doing to women to take away their clitoris. Uh, mm -hmm. where, is that from the Quran? Or is that just uh, a that cultural is... thing that they, was added on later? So it's, it's from the Hadith. So in Islam, it's about the, the Quran and the Hadith. So that's the, the Sunnah, the, the way the Prophet lived and his companions lived and the, you know, the, the notes that they left behind for, for Muslims to follow. Mm -hmm. um, and there are four schools of thought in Islamic jurisprudence. And out of the four, 
three of them say that it is mandatory and one of the schools of thought says it's recommended. So none of them say don't, don't do, do it. it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the people who don't get it done to their daughters say, well, it's only recommended. So I'm choosing not to do it because I'm going to follow this school of thought. Um, but there are unfortunately a vast number of people who, um, choose to do it to their daughters. And, and it is, it is partially cultural as well. So you'll see it more in some countries than you will in other countries. Mm. And that happens because there's like this stigma against girls who haven't had it done to them, that they're dirty or that they're whores and no man's ever going to marry them. Um, I'm going to recommend a book to your listeners called Please. Infidel, written mm. by Ayan Hersi Ali, who is a survivor of FGM. She's from Somalia, where the numbers are like over 90%. Mm -hmm. um, and she talks about being in school. And if you think of a bathroom in schools, there's like three or four stalls next to each other. And they her her peers could tell from like the strength of her stream as she was going to the bathroom that she wasn't circumcised. And they started bullying her over it oh because God. of course, not only do they cut off the clitoris, but they sew you shut um, so that nothing can get in there until your husband is ready to. Um, I didn't know that. So... Yes. Yeah. And so when they sewed her shut, they, they put a plank in between her legs and then tied her legs together so that she wouldn't open her legs and tear the seams. Um, and she, she talks about the entire grueling ordeal. Uh, most women that have undergone FGM have just blocked it out completely. Mm. It's just incredibly mm. traumatic, as you can imagine, both physically and psychologically, because this is your mom and your aunt and your cousins right. are all involved in doing this to you. They're the ones that are holding your legs down. Um, and you don't really know what's happening because it's a party and there's flowers and they put you in a pretty dress and oh my goodness and you, you, yeah yeah oh my goodness and so I have it's, to, it's quite I, the shock i want to connect the dots because i know a lot of my listeners are aware of the nexium cult and how the leader keith yes. Ranieri was uh sentenced to 120 years for trafficking and what got this story about his mind control cult out was the branding of women near their genitals of his um, initials, initials and Allison Mack's initials. But compared to th that, this is far more devastating and widespread around the world. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so there, there are a lot of, obviously there's a lot of feminist Muslim women that are pushing against FGM, you know, but of course they're up against religious scholars, so they're deemed to be more uh, reputable. Um, hmm. Same thing with the domestic violence, the Quran, like the words of Allah literally say, if you fear disobedience or arrogance from your wives, beat them. So hmm. once Allah has told men to beat their wives, how can these women come along now and say, we want to criminalize domestic abuse? And child marriage and so many other yeah, let's aspects. Let's get into child marriage because that was another thing that I learned about for the first time. And uh, what what I read in your book was that Mohammed said as soon as a, a girl has menses, uh, enters puberty, she's ready to get married. Oh, and no, she's she can get married before that. But once she menstruates, that's when you can start to have intercourse her, essentially oh my yeah goodness that yeah. is so upsetting um i can't imagine it's really hard for me to wrap my mind around it we're in the you know we're in 2022 and this is happening to large numbers of people around the world and um, you know and and steve i have to mention to you because this is really important and this is the subtitle of my of my of my book mm -hmm. um sam harris did a ted talk where he was talking about uh, women in afghanistan and girls in afghanistan and how when there's cults in in texas flds i don't know if they were in texas or where they were but when there are cults that have polygamy and child marriage and things like that 
we get the FBI in there. We protect these girls, even though the girls are saying, it's my choice. I love my right. husband. We understand these girls have been indoctrinated and we protect them. Yep. But when we talk about girls in Afghanistan or when we talk about FGM or when we talk about child marriage, we talk about all these things that we're talking about. You know, at the end of his TED talk, let, let me just say this, at the end of his TED talk, the the uh, the master of ceremonies came up on stage and started to push back against Sam and ask him if his words were being Islamophobic mm. and if he was being bigoted for speaking up for mm -hmm. women on the other side of the world and the young girls on the other side of the world. That's a real problem that we can have these conversations and we can talk about these atrocities when it's happening here or in other countries, if it's done in a Christian context or because of a, a Christian cult or because of a secular cult, mm -hmm. or, you know, but once it's coming from this Islamic context, suddenly it's the sacred cow that we can't talk about. And mm. that's why I can talk to you about the degrees. That's why it's up in the 90 percent, mm. because it it has this protection. It, it, it enjoys this protection from criticism. And that is what stunts the progress. That's what prevents the progress is that whenever anybody tries to talk about progress, they're shut down, they're silenced, they're being told uh, you're being a bigot, you're being a sabophobic, you're being et cetera, et cetera. And the truth is those girls are every deserving, they're deserving of every right that every other girl has across the planet. These are universal human rights, as you said at the beginning of our conversation. Yep. These are not Western human rights right. you know and and so why should we sort of why should we advocate for these girls and not these girls you know i think that it's very important that we 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 do speak out against these atrocities regardless of where they're happening so um and i i believe uh it was bill maher who who uh came out as well and I, I would like to give you my feedback in terms of this, because for me, the last seven years or so, I've been studying information warfare, like psychological warfare that countries do to each other and cults have learned to do. And this what's called fourth generation warfare, where there's a deliberate attempt to ramp up the left and ramp up the right to hate each other more mm -hmm. so they can set up a scene for civil warfare where people are killing each other and you know the world is complex and things aren't so black and white all or nothing and so my two cents would be if we could go back in time would be to frame it in terms of extremist Jewish cults and extremist Christian cults and Islamic extremist cults and 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 uh, I know Sam and Bill are atheists. They're in, in in a sense very ideologically atheists. I am not myself, but I'm not someone who believes in a Zeus-like humanoid male floating in the clouds at all. I'm much more of a you know, God, the divine is in all of us and all mm -hmm. living beings. So forgive my progressive, you know, point of view, but that's what no, I've arrived at at age 68. But this it's so in other words, whatever, whenever someone takes a strong position in, in, in this culture with the Internet is almost an automatic backlash with the intention to stir people up instead of stepping back and going, let's look at the bigger picture. And yes, mm -hmm. let's look at the past and let's think about the kind of world we want to live in. And, um, um, you know, it's nobody's perfect. And in my experience, no one has the truth. Maybe God Almighty has the truth who's beyond space and time if such a being, he, she, or it exists. But uh, I do believe in love. And I do believe love is not a scientifically evidence-based practice you can prove. You feel it. It's visceral and it's also demonstrated by by behavior and for me again my um forgive me for opining so so long but i really believe 
in the great commandment of the Abrahamic faiths. Love God with all your heart, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's about love, not fear, not hatred. Mm -hmm. And part of it is loving yourself, which means, and, and loving God with all your heart means with your doubts. For me, the heart isn't just passionate obedience. It's about that life's complex and mm -hmm. uh, we need to figure this out together and because we're stronger together. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I am sick of the patriarchy <laughs> and the white Me male too. privilege. <laughs> I'm white and I'm male. I'm also Jewish with a Arabic sounding last name. Uh, and uh, so I've, I've, I've been attacked by people thinking I'm an Arab because of my name. And I w couldn't get on a plane for a year after 9-11 because Hassan, are you kidding? You're not getting wow. on a plane or and pat patted. So I'm very sensitive to to discrimination. And I don't know, forgive me for opining, but it just seems to me like we need to get past this low level of of uh, us versus them or we have a a pie and if you get more I get less versus let's help each other to grow and, and evolve and change and not be stuck in the past but really think about how to how to manifest love on on higher and higher levels so beautiful so yeah, I, I we're, we're, we're gonna we're gonna need to wrap up but I really hope to meet you and I really want to be in touch uh, going forward, maybe we can put a panel together or something, get an, an ex-Jewish, you know, uh, extremist, an ex-Christian and yourself, and we can like really connect the dots. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? I would love that. Yeah, I yeah. did that uh, in the past before with a, a woman who was a, a member of the Hasidic Jewish community in New York and a woman who was a member of the Westboro Baptist Church. And that was a fascinating conversation. I think I know both so. women. So that let's let's uh, <laughs> reach out and maybe we can do a, a redo. There's one more piece I want to say as we wrap up, and I'm going to give you the last word. But um, I've been very aware for 46 years of, of uh, sociologists of religion who have been paid by cults to write positive articles about them and say what wonderful people there are. And there's a real effort to try to uh, make religious freedom mm -hmm. a pass to do all kinds of criminal, illegal, yep. unethical, anti-human rights things. I have a blog written by an ex-Scientologist about one of the main culprits, in my opinion, Massimo Intervigne of, of Italy, uh, and he has a whole center, and they just want to make it like you can't talk negatively about any religion, and it's like, why not? And if, if a group is using deceptive recruitment, then people are not getting informed consent, and that's part of trafficking. <laughs> that's you know, fraud, right? It's part mm -hmm. of why I, I went and did my doctoral work on, on updating the law with undue influence because we should be able to discriminate healthy religions from unhealthy religions by their practices. Yeah, absolutely. And also in your book, you talked about how there is, you know, uh, political reasons for why they won't speak out as well too, because if they're getting campaign support or if they're getting promised a certain amount of votes from this community, then they won't speak out against the atrocities that are happening there and they won't support the people that are in those communities that are screaming for help. So yeah, people yeah, are exactly. incredibly psychotically selfish. Hmm. Um, probably I, I used psycho psychotically in the wrong manner well, right now. Out um, of touch with reality, I, I can see how that could apply, you know, for sure. I do want to add one more thing that I just that just happened, which is Japan has passed a law against my former cult in Japan with, yeah, I read with the that. aim of wanting to take away their religious tax exemption status. 
because they were involved with one of the largest consumer fraud scams in Japanese history where they were knocking on people's door who had just lost a loved one saying, your deceased yeah. relative told me to come here and tell you to yeah. go to the bank and get money because we need to do a liberation ceremony. So anyway, there's some glimmer, at least uh, in Japan, uh, that, that, that the public is saying it's not okay for uh, lawmakers to be in bed with the moon cult. They've been yeah. harmful to Japan. So yeah. fingers crossed. You get the last words, Yasmin Mohammed. Please, <laughs> what do you want to leave well, us with? Uh, I would leave, want to leave you with, actually, I'm going to reiterate your words about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and also what you said about treat, you know, want, what was it that you said? You want the love for your neighbors as you love for yourself. So I want people to remember that. When they start to talk about um, protecting minority communities or protecting women, protecting, you know, gay rights, remember that it's not only here but it's your neighbors in other areas around the world too um it's 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 devastating for people in those countries who are trying so hard to get their voices out to speak out against you know how they're being killed or how they're being forced to wear hijab or they'll be imprisoned and all of those things and then they find that the powerful west is you know endorsing the hijab with a nike swoosh or is selling it in Lululemon, that is a real betrayal to the people that are working so hard, mm -hmm. risking their lives, in fact, mm -hmm. to get their voices out um, and to speak up against these inequalities. So yeah, just exactly that. Just please be aware that um, they are no different than you. They are not an alien species. They right. do not like wearing the burqa, you know, this, this, this Islamist propaganda that you have been sold is is as thin as tissue, and I don't understand how people have accepted it. Um, all of it is lies. You should recognize it as lies. Think of it as yourself. You know, would I be happy with that if I was forced to wear certain clothing, or if I was told I'm not allowed to ride a bicycle, or not allowed to sing, or all of these things? And speaking out against these human rights atrocities is not bigoted. It is the right. exact opposite of bigoted. Right. Um, that's what makes us, you know, good human beings as we speak out against evils. Yeah. So that's the, awesome. my last And word. I recommend people listen to your book because I love when authors read their own stories, especially your story is so poignant. So... And then, of course, if you want to buy the paperback or you know, the hardcover, please do, too. But um, Yasmin Mohammed, thank you so much for your, your you. courage, your strength, your, your heart, your desire to help others. Um, and I do hope we get to meet someday. We will, for person. sure. Thank you so much. Thanks so Take much. Care. Bye.